warm welcome again to HTBB. You saw there that Alpha begins again on the 7th of March uh, in here, in English, in the hall behind in Mandarin. Food from 7 p.m. We start at 8, always finish at 9.30. And it's a great, fun place to meet people, but to explore life's big questions, the questions we don't normally have the space or the time to ask in everyday life. Why am I here? What's my purpose? How can I get direction and guidance in life? Why do bad things happen? What about other religions? Does God heal today? These big questions. Hopefully you've been given some invitation cards in the way, way in. If not, do grab them. And please be thinking, who might you want to bring along with you? A friend, a colleague, a family member, or if you've never done Alpha before yourself, you might want to consider giving it a go. Uh, I always learn something every time. So that's Alpha beginning again on the 7th of March. Also, as you've seen, the leadership conference is coming up in May, uh, the 21st and 22nd of May. I want to encourage you to sign up, to come along, be a part of it. Uh, the early bird rate uh, continues till the end of this month. And maybe you've thought about it and you thought, well, you know, I don't know if that's really for me. I'm not a leader. But I'd like to suggest that if you're serving anyone in any capacity in your life, then you are a leader. If we sow service, we reap influence. And leadership is influence. And we can often think we're not a leader because we use the world's definition of leadership to measure ourselves by. But Jesus gives us a radically different model, a different definition of servant leadership. So in one sense, the conference could be called the serving conference, but it's a lot less sexy if we call it that. You know, SC18 doesn't have the same ring. And sociologists reckon that even the most introverted of us will influence at least 10,000 people in our lifetime. And leadership is a way to express love because it's a way to serve others. And humility is not trying to put yourself down. Humility is trying to lift others up. And sometimes the best way to do that is from a position of leadership. And leadership is simply lifting others up higher. And this is our calling as God's people, to serve, to lead. The promise of God in Deuteronomy 28, verse 13, is if we obey, then the Lord will make you the head, not the tail. And leadership comes in all different shapes and sizes with different aspects. And I'd like to talk on Christian leadership today. And the way we're going to do this is I'm going to look at some different aspects of leadership from some of David's mighty men in the Old Testament. You'll know the background. Uh, young David is anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel after Saul. Saul, King Saul, gets jealous. He tries to kill David. David's on the run, and he ends up at the cave of Adullam a natural stronghold. And to his surprise, whilst he's at that cave, young men start pouring to be with him, start coming to be with him in the cave. In fact, 400 men come. And scripture tells us that all of them are either distressed, in debt, or discontented. The three Ds. Not great raw material for David. But he takes these 400 and he transforms them into a 3D army that is the most effective fighting force in Israel's history. And we don't quite know how he does it, but one thing's for sure is that anointing rubs off. So if you can think of uh, a good leader whom you, you admire, maybe a leader in your family or in your workplace or at your church, and you, and you think, I want to learn, then get close to them. Try and spend some time with them. Uh, hang out with them because leadership, uh, anointing for leadership rubs off. But the other thing we see here at the cave of Adullam is that with God, the rejects become the redeemed. Those whom others have written off, God has written on the palm of his hand. 
If you feel a zero, God can make you a hero. And this 3D army has 400 of these guys in it. But within the 400, there are 30 of them who are known as David's mighty men. And out of these 30, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, we, we hear some of the details, the exploits of just a few of them. And this is the passage we're going to look at to draw out some of these lessons of what leadership looks like for the people of God. So let's pray if we may. Lord, thank you so much for this passage, your word. Thank you for all that is contained in it. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would open it up to our hearts and minds now. That we'd see what it means to begin to serve, to step out, to lead for you. And to be used by you for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to begin at verse 8. And the first mighty men that we come, mighty man we come across is Joshua. So this is 2 Samuel 23 verse 8. These are the names of David's mighty warriors. Joshua Bashabeth, a Tachamanite, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. I wonder, have you ever been in a fight? Maybe as a kid at school. Uh, or even if it's not a fist fight, maybe you've been in an argument. We've probably all been in one of those, right? Fighting somebody is hard work. Fighting eight people is really hard work. Fighting 80 is extraordinary. But fighting 800, I mean, that's outrageous. Joshua teaches us about being willing to pioneer, to do that which has never been done before. He is the first listed amongst the mighty men, and he sets the bar to new standards. And sometimes God wants us to be the first, to break out, to pioneer, to be the catalyst, to bring our very best now and not to wait. I don't know, maybe you're the first Christian in your family. Maybe you're the pioneer for Christ in your family. And it's been really tough. But because of what the Lord has pioneered through you in your family, others will follow. Or, or maybe you're a pioneer insofar as you run your own business. Or perhaps you're thinking of going it alone, of doing a startup. Or maybe. You're not, but you're about to start a new project or join a new team at work. Or maybe you're entering new uncharted waters in a relationship. Or, or maybe the, the call to pioneer for you is not to start something new, but to do something familiar in a new way. Maybe to change your work habits or think about maybe changing how you parent a child. And, and I tend to think that when we think of pioneering, it can f feel a bit scary and a bit exhausting. So maybe if you're like me, you tend to draw back from doing it, but then feel a little bit guilty about not doing it. I mean, life coaches and gurus, they're always telling us to step out of your comfort zone. They say nothing happens in your comfort zone. Actually, that's not true. I'll tell you what happens in my comfort zone. Comfort. <laughs> and that's okay. I mean, life is not binary. It's not like we have to spend all our days in our comfort zone or all of our time pioneering. Actually, if you spent every waking moment pioneering, you'd probably burn out. But we have a rhythm to life. We pioneer, then we take a day of rest. Or we pioneer, and then, oh, we treat ourselves. Or then we pioneer, and then recharge with family and friends. Think of Joshua. He didn't spend his whole life killing 800 soldiers. We're told he did it in one encounter. 
And I'm pretty confident that at the end of it, he didn't think, oh, well, that was easy. Bring on the next 800 right now. He would have been exhausted and then probably retreated back to the comfort of his cozy cave of Adullam to have his favorite food for dinner. When we think of this rhythm of life, then the thought of maybe stepping out and pioneering for the Lord doesn't seem quite so overwhelming. I wonder how is the Lord asking you to pioneer for Jesus at this time? That's verse eight. Verse nine, we then see the second guy. He is called Eliezer. Let's have verse nine, here we go. Next to him was Eliezer, son of Dodai, the Ahohite. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pastamim for battle. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eliezer stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eliezer, but only to strip the dead when the work had been done. Now, Eliezer teaches us about being willing to stand alone and not retreat. God may ask you to take a stand for something that is right, even if it means standing alone. Or he may ask you to see something through that you've begun. You see, it was David and his men that taunted the Philistines. They started it. But the moment the Philistines engaged them, the Israelite army runs away. Apart from Eliezer. He takes a stand. Eliezer says, I've started, so I'll finish. And I just wonder, I have a sense, maybe that's a word for somebody here today. The Lord is encouraging you, saying, you've started, so finish. And David himself, he knew what it was like to stand alone. I mean, when he was a, uh, a, a young boy, he'd been sent with the food for his older brothers in the army, and his brothers rejected him. And then later that that very day, he stood alone facing the giant Goliath and won. Or think of Jesus. He was not honored in his hometown. Nazareth rejected him. And he knew what it was to wrestle in prayer alone in the Garden of Gethsemane. And ultimately, he knew what it was to be completely alone, cut off by sin on the cross. God might call us to stand alone. And often it's those closest to us who can retreat. But sometimes I think our uh, desire for likability, for popularity, can hold us back. We can, can't we, easily become the, the social media generation living for a like. Or maybe you don't want to take a stand because you've already known what it feels like to be alone, and you want somebody to stand with you. A friend of mine on uh, social media shared this text conversation he had this past week. The text comes in, I'm here for you, thanks. I'm going through a really tough time, so it means a lot. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost my context. Who is this? This is your Uber driver. <laughs> I am here to pick you up. He just wanted somebody to be there for him. And we all know what that feels like, don't we? But here's the great encouragement. This stand by Eliezer is recorded in one other place in the Old Testament. It's in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 11. And in that other account of Eliezer's stand, we see that he was not quite alone. One other Israelite stood with him shoulder to shoulder and fought. Who? King David himself. And when we take a stand to finish what we've begun, to do that which is right, we're not alone. 
the messianic king himself, Jesus, stands with us. His promise to you and me is, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. He is with you by his Holy Spirit. You're never alone. Next, we get to verse 11, and the third character is Shama. It says this, verse 11. Next to him was Shama, son of Agi, the Hararite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. Now, Shammah teaches us that a lot of our opportunities to serve and to lead begin in a field of lentils. What do I mean? Well, let's be honest. Lentils are a little bit bland, a little bit ordinary. Leadership often doesn't look exciting. It doesn't look like a blockbuster moment. It involves a lot of bland things, a lot of ordinary things, like the hard work behind the scenes, like admin or at church, like moving chairs or making the coffee, or in your home, serving your family. There, last week, I, I met this woman called Nike. Great name, right? Nike. Must be easy finding personalized clothes. <laughs> and um, I said, what do you do? And she said, well, I, I work for a, a missions organization. And she explained how, like, as with an army, for every soldier in the field, it takes about 10 people in the back office to support them the logistics and all. And she said, I'm one of the back office people. So for every missionary in the field, there's a team to support them. And she said, I, I, I crunch the financials, I do the logistics, I help with the admin support. And I said to her, wow, that, that, that's amazing. You are making such a difference in the kingdom of God. And then she started crying. I thought, oh no, what did I say? And she said, no, 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 she said, thank you. She said, it's just so easy to forget the impact that you're making. So, are you willing to stand in your field of lentils and defend it? Because when we do, like Nike, like Shama, then the Lord will use it to bring about a great victory. Now, I think part of the problem is that often it can feel like everyone else has a better field than us, right? Particularly if you're on social media. It's like, oh, how come they've got durian trees in their field? I've only got lentils. But comparison kills destiny. Because what we're doing on social media is not a fair comparison. We're comparing our backstage mess with everyone else's front stage perfection. And comparison kills destiny. But let's not forget what it says in Hebrews chapter 12. It encourages us to run the race marked out for you. It doesn't say run the race marked out for them. That's why at the start of a running race, it says, on your marks, get set, go. It doesn't say, on, on their marks, get set, go, where am I going? And I sense the Lord is saying to some of us today, in your lentil field, get set, go. And the reality is that everyone, every single person has lentils in their field. And remember, no lentils, no dal. <laughs> and no dal, no roti chennai, eh? <laughs> exactly. And I love the fact that Shama is almost certainly defending 
someone else's lentil field. It's not even his own field. You know, maybe you are serving someone else's lentil field. That can be a valid, crucially important, good, God-given calling. Uh, it, It may come as no surprise to you to know that when I was at theological college training for ministry, I was basically the joke in the college. And that was because when people said, hey, Miles, what do you want to do? I had no clue whatsoever. I had absolutely zero vision for my life or my upcoming ministry. The only thing I knew was that God, I I felt pretty confident that God had asked me to go and get ordained. And uh, towards the end of my time at college, I got the opportunity to to go and be um, interviewed for a potential position at HTB the church in London, and I was interviewed by Nicky Gumbel, which was pretty nerve-wracking. And he asked me all these questions, and I tried to answer, and then he asked me this question. So, Miles, what vision do you have for your ministry? I thought, oh, no, the one question I was dreading. I thought, well, do I, do I make something up, or do I just tell him the truth? Of course, you, you just you just got to tell the truth. So I said, well, if I'm really honest with you, I don't have any vision for my ministry. <laughs> but if I see a vision that I think is good and is God-given, then I'm really happy to serve that. And I thought I'd blown it, but I later found out that was the only answer I gave that he actually liked. And <laughs> And it meant that I got the chance to serve in that lentil field in London. And no HTB, no HTBB. No HTBB, no Alpha Asia Hub serving thousands of churches in 24 countries across the region. Oh. Thanks, Ravin. (laughs) Don't belittle taking a stand in the lentil field. Next up, in verse 13, we have these guys who are simply known as the three. During harvest time, that's about May, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of Adullam while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So, the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. That's not David being ungrateful. He's just like, oh my goodness, you could have died. What are you doing? Now, these three teach us a number of things. First of all, um, we don't know their names. We don't, we're not given their names here. You know, when we serve the Lord, we're not in it to make a name for ourselves, but for him. But the important lesson from the three that I think we should draw out is this. It's as we serve, as we lead, it's the importance of having a spirit of honor. You see, when David says, oh, that I could get a drink from the well at Bethlehem, he doesn't mean it literally. But these guys so honor David that they go on this daring mission behind enemy lines just to bring him back a cup of water. During World War II, one of my um, grandfathers was parachuted behind enemy lines in Greece on a mission. And he completed the mission and got out, but as he was leaving as a, as a souvenir, he got a bullet in the leg. And 
Why did he do it? Well, he did it for the honor of king and country. We should honor those who have gone before us. We should honor those who are ahead of us. We should honor the older, the wiser, the more mature. And we should seek, like the three did, to refresh them with the water of encouragement. And this same principle applies in our families and in our workplaces. So here's a top tip. Speak well of your boss to their face. Speak really well of your boss behind their back. And this matters. It matters, this honor business, because the New Testament tells us that Jesus had no honor in his hometown. And it says, therefore, he couldn't do many miracles there. And think of the Ten Commandments. The commandment to honor your father and mother is the only commandment that comes with a promise attached to it. And what's the promise? So that you may live long and that it may go well with you. We learn the importance of honor. Fifthly, verse 18, there's Abishai. We read this. Abishai, the brother of Joab, son of Jeruah, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 300 men whom he killed. And so he became as famous as the three. Was he not held in greater honor than the three? He became their commander even though he was not included among them. I think one of the things that Abishai teaches us is the importance of humility. I mean, everyone was talking about the three. They probably had posters of the three on their walls in the caves of Adullam. And if I'd been Abishai, I probably would have been thinking, how can I make the three into the four? It has such a better ring about it. Or maybe I'd be thinking, how could I be D'Artagnan to their three musketeers? But Abishai doesn't think like this. He's a humble guy, and he goes, okay, I'm just going to keep my head down and get on with the job that I've been given. And he does that. And he does it brilliantly. And maybe somebody here today, you need that encouragement. Maybe you're feeling a little bit overlooked at the moment, a bit undervalued. But perhaps the Lord is saying to you, don't worry, I see you. Well done. Keep going. Keep your head down. Do the job I've given you. And amazingly, Abishai eventually becomes the boss, the commander of the three because of his faithfulness and humility. And then finally, sixthly, my favorite one of all the mighty men. You're going to love this guy. He's outrageous. He's called Benaiah, verse 20. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant fighter from Kabzeel, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down a huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaiah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. He too was as famous as the three mighty warriors. He was held in greater honor than any of the 30, but he was not included among the three. And David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Now, I think the first thing that Benaiah teaches us is about seeing opportunity. Imagine, you're walking in a field, and you see a lion. What's your first reaction? Danger. Benaiah, he sees a lion, and he thinks, ah, furry opportunity. And he chases it. You know, when everyone else is running away from a lion, 
God may call you to chase it. Now, worldly speaking, Benaiah had no chance of catching it. I mean, lions can run up to 35 miles per hour. In one or two leaps, they can bound 30 meters. He had no right even to think he could catch this thing. But he chases it anyway. Uh, when I was a schoolboy, I remember one year we went on a school trip to London. And there was one uh, hour in the afternoon where we were allowed in, in groups to go off on our own around lunchtime, and then to come back by a particular time. And I was with a group, and we didn't really know where we were going, so we just sort of wandered, and we ended up in a slightly dodgy part of town. And uh, at one particular point, we noticed that a friend of ours who was in the group, just over there, was suddenly surrounded by a couple of youths, other boys, who were pushing him around. And my friend and I, we just shouted, Oi! And we started running towards them. And although we were in like very proper uniform, I, I think the fact that we were suddenly running at them, we startled these two youths in hoodies, and they were sort of slightly afraid, so started running. And we ran past our friend and continued in hot pursuit. And we were running after these two boys. And then I, this thought suddenly came into my head. What happens when I catch them? <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. So I just started to slow down a bit, and I think my friend had the same thought at the same time, because we both sort of stopped and went, should we go back? Yes. <laughs> and you, if you're chasing a lion, you must be thinking, what actually happens if I catch up with this thing? But Benaiah, he doesn't care. He keeps on chasing anyway. And what's more, it's a snowy day. You know about snow, right? <laughs> no, of course you don't. No. Snow, if it then gets really cold, gets a bit icy. And it's not easy to walk on snow. It's kind of like slightly <laughs> skiddy. It's really hard to run on snow. Actually, if you're running on snow, four legs good, two legs bad. If you're chasing a lion on a sunny day, that's hard enough. Chasing a lion on a snowy day, that's really tough. But you know, with God, the right place often feels like the wrong place. The right time often feels like the wrong time. But the best time to step out for God is now. Don't wait for the perfect sunny day. And anyway, the, the lion then falls into a pit. Now, at this point, I probably would have got to the edge of the pit and thought, oh, thank goodness, lucky escape. What on earth was I thinking? But not Benaiah. He gets to the pit and goes, ah, now he's trapped. And he jumps in. He jumps in. I mean, what was he thinking? See, seeing a lion doesn't normally look like opportunity. Being in a pit with a lion doesn't normally look like a good day at the office. Although maybe your office feels a bit like a lion pit. <laughs> but God may take you to extraordinary places to do extraordinary things. When the Bible translators were trying to translate the Bible into the language of the Maasai tribe in Ken Kenya and Tanzania, they hit a problem. You see, in the Maasai language, there's no word for faith. They never had a word for faith. So working with those early Maasai believers, they found a way of translating the word faith. The word faith in Maasai simply means to chase a lion. So here's the question. Are you prepared to chase a lion on a snowy day? Benaiah teaches us that when you see opportunity, you seize opportunity. Now, by definition, we can't prepare for the specifics of opportunity, but we can prepare our hearts to see it and to chase it in faith. But what Benaiah also teaches us is the importance to stay hungry and to keep going. 
You see, he kills two Moabite champions. He could have stopped then, but he didn't. He won't stop. He keeps going. He then kills a lion. At this point, I would have stopped. I would have put the lion skin on my living room wall, and I would have dined out on stories of killing a lion on a snowy day for years to come. But not Beniah. He won't stop. He stays hungry, and he then kills a giant Egyptian. In other words, don't be satisfied with past glories. Don't be satisfied with past victories. Believe that with God, the best is yet to come. I also had the chance recently to meet this outstanding uh, young leader from Nagaland in northeast India called Jonathan. An amazing guy. And he was telling me about um, how he came to faith than the first time he did any ministry for the Lord. And what it was, it was him and his uh, two friends, they were 19 years of age, they went to this remote town in Nagaland. And uh, one guy was gonna play the guitar and sing worship. The other guy was responsible for production, for the amp and the speaker. And then Jonathan was gonna step forward and for the first time ever, speak and explain the gospel message. So the guy started, they, they plugged in, the guy started singing and a big crowd gathered. And then it got to the point where Jonathan stepped forward with the mic and he began to explain the good news about Jesus to the crowd. And as he got towards the end of his message, he saw coming in the distance a group of young men with swords looking very angry and approaching. So Jonathan turned to the other two and said, oh my goodness, look at them. They're coming. Do you think this is because they're offended by the gospel message? And then the guy who was responsible for, for production said, no, I think it's my fault. You see, I, I plugged the speaker and the amp into the local temple. <laughs> and they're from the temple. And they just looked at each other and went, run! So they, they got their gear and they just ran into the fields and they kept running and they kept running and they kept running. Eventually they sort of collapsed out of exhaustion, but thankfully the guys with the swords had given up pursuit by that point. And I said to Jonathan, oh my goodness, <laughs> you must have thought, I'm never doing anything like that again. And he said, no. He said, that was the moment I knew I was definitely called to ministry. I thought, wow, this guy's like Benaiah. <laughs> he just keeps going. Maybe the Holy Spirit is encouraging you to keep going. Don't settle for less. The best is yet to come. And eventually, Benaiah becomes chief of David's bodyguard. Can you imagine the job interview? Benaiah's there with the other candidates. They're going around. So what do you do? Well, I do karate. How about you? Uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, BJJ. <laughs> and then they get to Benaya. What about you, Benaya? Oh, I killed a lion on a snowy day. <laughs> and then I killed an Egyptian giant. And David's thinking, giant? I killed one of those once. You're hired. <laughs> and he becomes chief of the bodyguards. But it doesn't even stop there. Elsewhere in scripture, we're told that eventually Benaiah succeeds Joab and becomes commander of the entire Israelite army. Believe in your life that with God, the best is yet to come. Amen? Would you like to stand, please? We're going to pray. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to come now, to fill us afresh with his love. So you may want to close your eyes or put your hands out in front of you as a way to signal to yourself that, yeah, Lord, I'm, I want to receive. I'm hungry for more. And we're just going to ask God to pour his love and power into us afresh by his Holy Spirit. So we just pray, come, Holy Spirit. Just ask the Lord to touch you now. 
It doesn't matter what you feel. It's that promise that Jesus says, how much more will my Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? If you ask, you receive. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you.